I'm not native to North Carolina. I'm a native New Englander. And so I um, am in the habit of giving people their money's worth, even if it's free. <laughs> so, so, uh, so if this talk it, it runs a little long, you know, bear with me. I'm trying to give you your money's worth on this. Tonight, uh, you're all going to be like scientists. We're going to review some data and we're going to reach some conclusions by the end. And I'm going to show a lot of slides that have tables and graphs. It's the kind of stuff that doctors look at all the time, going through the medical literature and so forth. And I hope that uh, you folks won't be intimidated by them. Their presence is really just to uh, show that what I'm explaining is, is in fact factual. It's not just based on my opinion and that it's actually rooted in studies uh, in the medical literature. So, you know, I, I, I told Lynn in my email <clears throat> to her today that you'll either be asleep uh, by the end of this talk or else you'll feel like you really learned a whole lot of stuff. And I hope it's the latter. So when Lynn invited me to speak to you tonight, I began to consider what I could talk about that would be of value. She shared with me in an email that you, know, you folks had an interest in the cardiovascular effects of cancer, uh, cancer treatments and how to maintain a healthy cardiovascular system. Uh, during and following uh, your cancer therapies. So although much of my workday is occupied with managing general cardiology matters, actually that whole list there made it sound like I'm jack of all trades and I guess I am in certain, certain respects. The cardio-oncology aspect of it is actually rather recent uh, because it is a new and emerging field. But as a cardio-oncologist, I kind of stand with one foot in cardiology and the other foot in oncology. Uh, so I kind of straddle both fields, and uh, I work on both sides of the fence. So to, as I mentioned, cardio-oncology is a new medical specialty. Its mission is to provide cancer survivors and their oncologists with guidance to help minimize the short and long-term adverse cardiovascular effects of cancer and cancer therapies, minimize interruptions to potentially life-saving cancer treatments, and promote the overall good health of folks like you. The interconnection between cancer and cardiovascular disease is complex. Multiple studies have demonstrated that cardiovascular risk factors are more prevalent in cancer survivors. There are common risk factors like smoking and obesity, and identical risk factors may lead to cardiovascular disease in one individual, but may ca cause cancer in another, or perhaps even both diseases in the same person. However, the mere presence of cardiovascular risk factors appears to be insufficient to fully account for all the cardiovascular risk in the cancer population. In fact, there's a growing awareness that although great strides have been achieved in extending cancer survival, cardiotoxic effects of cancer therapy and accelerated underlying cardiovascular disease may produce a sort of glass ceiling that limits overall survival. As a result of this overlap of cancer and cardiovascular disease, it's become clear that managing a diagnosis of cancer must go beyond getting the cancer under control. I'm going to share with you tonight my interpretation of what I have identified in the medical literature as being important concepts that improve overall survival, not only cancer survival, and to help maintain the best quality of life possible. Now, some of this will be eye-opening, but I hope that all of it will be empowering. Let's start with a look at the increased cardiovascular disease incidence in cancer survivors. It's a little bit of busy. I think you can see it better up on the screen behind me, um, but I'll describe what's going on there for you. Uh, this is based on a retrospective study of cancer survivors who were under the age of 40 years at the time of their cancer diagnosis. And it reveals that even after adjusting for you know, the cardiovascular risk factors that we're all familiar with, survivors of lung cancer had anywhere from a 30% to 90% increased risk for cardiovascular disease. The community-based atherosclerotic risk in communities or ERIC study was initiated in 1987, and it was designed to study the development of cardiovascular disease in four communities, one of which is our own Forsyth County, North Carolina. And using data derived from this study, the investigators evaluated the burden of cardiovascular disease in cancer survivors. As shown in the figure, cancer survivors in general have a 37% higher likelihood of cardiovascular disease. Now to explain how to look at this table, um, HR uh, doesn't stand for heart rate or human resources. In this case, it stands for hazard ratio and neutral is one. So you see that vertical line that says one, basically anything above one is um, a, a, an effect. Um, uh, such as, in this case, higher cardiovascular disease uh, incidence. 
So you can see that for any cancer, the HR or hazard ratio is 1.37. So that means that basically you have 1.37 times higher risk of cardiovascular disease or 37% increase. So that's why I get that number. As a group, patients with a history of lung cancer have even a greater risk. We'll look at uh, the next slide, but you can see here lung cancer 2.37. If you look down, any cancer is above, lung cancer is below. Uh, adjusted subgroup analysis reveals one and a half times the risk of clinical heart coronary heart disease more than two times the risk of stroke and almost three times the risk of heart failure. This is a, a blow up of that to show it a little more clearly. So again, uh, we see in the subpopulation of lung cancer, coronary heart disease, 1.41. That's where we get about one and a half times stroke, 2.4, almost two and a half and heart uh, failure, two and three quarters, basically. Researchers at uh, Washington University in St. Louis looked at non-small cell lung cancer patients who had non-contrast uh, chest CTs as part of their radiation treatment planning. So these researchers, um, uh, they uh, evaluated coronary calcification. So uh, I wanted to tell you what coronary calcification is. It's basically hardening of the arteries. It is the radiographic, literally radiographic uh, hardening of the arteries. Mm -hmm. So everybody who has lung cancer has chest CTs. And if you look in the right panel, that's a slice through the chest. They're cross-sectional uh, images. Down at the bottom at six o'clock, that's the spine. You can see the posterior ribs coming out underneath it. And over the top, you see those dark, uh, those uh, white areas, those are the ribs. So um, calcium is attracted to cholesterol plaque and uh, x-rays are very good at seeing calcium. That's why we see bone so well. And that's why we see the bones of the back, the backbone and the ribs so well. If you look in the center of that image there, you see something that uh, goes off at two angles there. That's not bone. There's not supposed to be any bone in the middle of the chest there. That actually are coronary arteries that are calcified. So this patient has uh, hardening of the arteries and their blood vessels are all calcified from plaque there. And um, this, is, this is not subtle in this case. Uh, most often uh, what you see is a little, little eggshell rim um, of the calcium. In this case, it, it pretty much encases the whole vessel. But, but when we talk about coronary artery calcifications, that's what we're talking about. So this, this study uh, from Washington University in St. Louis, um, they compared um, patients, their, their non-small cell lung cancer patients who had the chest CTs as part of their radiation treatment planning. And after adjusting for age and sex, the coronary artery calcium group was associated with increased risk for cardiovascular disease. And when you uh, graded the amount of calcium, uh, patients who had mild coronary artery calcium had 12 times the increased risk for major adverse cardiac events like heart attack. Those who had severe had 21 times the increased risk. So it's really important to identify coronary artery calcifications. So recognizing patients with a high burden of coronary calcifications allows for the implementation of aggressive measures to try to reduce someone's risk. And such patients would benefit from taking a, a low dose aspirin a day, and they would benefit from taking a statin drug like Lipitor. So uh, we would strive to get someone's LDL cholesterol under 100. So LDL cholesterol is the bad one. You've got the total cholesterol, and then you have good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, triglycerides. LDL is the bad one. I tell people, think of L for lousy. So the lousy cholesterol is the LDL. So if you have coronary artery calcifications, you have heart disease already. When I see patient, new patients in the office and I'm looking through their electronic medical record, I will scan their imaging section to see if they've had any um, uh, CT scans. And I look in the reports to see if, they, if the radiologist mentions coronary artery calcium. You can see calcium in other vessels too. It's not just the coronary arteries. So uh, sometimes I've, I've had dentists send me patients because they're doing a panorex view of the mouth and they just happen to catch the coronary artery and they see calcium in the coronary artery and they send them to me. Um, sometimes people do uh, CT scans of the abdomen and pelvis. And again, you have major blood vessels, the aorta and so forth. You could get calcium in those blood vessels too. All those instances indicate that patients are at increased risk because they have atherosclerosis. And recently you heard about, you know, you shouldn't take low dose aspirin for primary prevention right? Because benefits don't outweigh the small risk of, of bleeding ulcers or bleed into the head if you take daily low-dose aspirin. However, aspirin is, 
is indicated for secondary prevention. People who have coronary calcium, they already have the disease. So taking a daily low dose aspirin would be indicated in such people. No. If you have coronary calci calcifications, you have atherosclerotic disease. So that would be for secondary prevention. But it is important for your doctors to pay attention to that because it's, it's kind of a gimme. So the question was that uh, it, it sounds like it's important that, that you all know whether or not you have coronary calci calcifications on CT scans, and it is. And um, you know, one thing that I want you to leave here with today is uh, the idea that when you are in the doctor's office, you know, bring that topic up, you know, you, you know, patients have all had CT scans and it's a, it's a really easy thing to go to the last CT scan because that's the one you have to go to the last one. Cause if you had, if you had coronary calci calcifications to, you know, uh, on your most recent one, it, it, it doesn't matter what the other ones showed. So, and if you don't have it on your most recent one, you don't have it. So, so all you have to do is go to the, the last uh, CT scan report and have your doctor just, just go through it. And if there's, no, if there's no mention of any kind of calcifications, then that's good. Okay. But um, just following up on the fact that a lot of times coronary calcium is present. Um, this, this is a, a study of 168 patients who had early stage non-small cell lung cancer at Brigham and Women's in Boston. You know, a good place, right? That's a good, good medical center. And uh, these investigators found that coronary calcifications were present as an incidental finding on CT scans in 70% of those patients. And more than half of them had no idea that they had heart disease. Despite having uh, this cardiovascular disease risk marker present, however, a large percentage of these patients were not taking aspirin or statin. The conclusion of these investigators was that this omission represented a critical missed opportunity to try to lower somebody's uh, cardiovascular risk. And, you know, perhaps it's not really surprising. Um, I suppose it's easy to get preoccupied uh, when addressing a cancer diagnosis, right? Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of, yeah, I mean, it's kind of all consuming. Right. And it's almost as if you're wearing blinders for everything else. Um, and, you know, this is this is well documented because we know that diabetics who are undergoing cancer treatment, that their their diabetes gets neglected, too. So their hemoglobin A1C numbers, you know, get high because nobody's really paying attention to that. Everybody's focused on on the cancer. So uh, I want to get back to the radiologists. They are now routinely mentioning coronary artery calcifications in the report. There was a you know, big, big push to get them to, to include that, um, even when you're not looking for it. You know, even people now uh, who don't have cancer, they're getting the low-dose cancer screening CTs now, too. And a lot of other studies, too. There's a lot of other studies where... Uh, um, you could easily adapt them to also screen for coronary calcium. Um, and, you know, we just have to do it. Uh, and there is some, some movement in that direction um, because these are, these are patients that, you know, it's, it's kind of right there if you look for it and, um, and, and you need to treat those people. They are, they are uh, an important uh, group to treat. Again, uh, I wanted to mention, at your next office appointment, you may want to ask your medical provider to pull up your last CT scan for, for review. And it's not that they have to like pull up the images. They may say, well, I don't know how to read a, a, a CT scan. They don't have to read a CT scan. They just need to read the report. So here's a graph uh, that illustrates why this all matters. Uh, the lines, if you look in uh, A, graph A there, the lines demonstrate a steep increase in cardiac event rates for treated non-small cell lung cancer patients with coronary heart disease versus no coronary heart disease. And if you look time following radiation therapy start, at two years, almost 12% of coronary heart disease patients had a cardiac event versus only 2.5% of the other group. So again, lung cancer patients with coronary heart disease require special attention. That's why it's so critical to identify people who, e who don't even know they have coronary artery disease, but they have coronary calcifications. The necessity for radiation therapy, RT, for the treatment of many lung cancers adds to the potential cardiovascular disease burden in survivors. Radiation damages blood vessels and causes injury to heart muscle. Sometimes the heart is an unfortunate innocent bystander, <laughs> sort of caught in the line of fire from RT. And you can see here in this um, chest, day, we superimpose some lines to represent the lungs, so they're in, in the center there, uh, we have lines representing the heart, and we even have lines representing the coronary arteries. 
Um, so we have LM is left main artery. Uh, we have left circumflex artery, LAD, left anterior descending artery, right coronary artery. And you can see how easy it would be for um, the radiation, the beam of radiation uh, to also cross paths with the heart. And so it can actually damage the heart tissue. It could damage the uh, blood vessels of the heart. And radiation oncologists are tuned to this, and they do do their best with different techniques uh, to try to minimize heart exposure. We'll show you one simple uh, technique. It's a simple breath hold technique. So they just tell people to take a breath in, hold it. They uh, provide the radiation therapy. You can see on the uh, left side, the heart is in the radiation beam. Take, patient takes a breath, the diaphragm goes down, pulls the heart a little lower, it misses the heart. So those are the sorts of things that help. So here, here's an example uh, of what can happen if you can't get the heart out of the way. Um, the two uh, panels uh, on the right side, those are myocardial perfusion studies. I don't know if any of you are familiar with like a cardiolite stress test, something like that, nuclear medicine stress test. It's a, it's a myocardial perfusion image. We oftentimes use them to look at, to see if there's any evidence for a blockage or old heart attack. Um, basically, where it's all lit up there, that is the nuclear uh, medical radioisotope that is distributed in the blood vessels, taken up into the heart tissue, and um, it releases x-rays that we then uh, uh, image with our scanner. And in the pre-radiation therapy, um, slide there, uh, it, the bottom of the heart, the tip of the heart, which is at pointing at one o'clock there, you can see it's all nice and normal, but on the post-radiation one, it's gone. So what happened there is that um, that part of the heart, the tip of the heart was caught in the beam, it became scar tissue, and now it, it doesn't, scar tissue does, is not vascular, doesn't, doesn't take up any blood. So that's scar tissue at the tip of the heart after radiation therapy. You know, these are extreme cases. Um, again, radiation oncologists do make it their practice to try to spare the heart. Sometimes they can't spare it entirely though. And that's, that's where problems can arise. Depending on where, where the tumor is that you're rating, it may not be possible to get the heart out of the way. You know, you're, you're kind of stuck there sometimes. And so the question was, does it matter which side you're rating, the left side, the left lung or the right lung? Yeah, it, it probably, where it's there, it probably does spare the heart. But you also have to worry about your blood vessels here too, because again, it's not only the heart, it's the blood vessels too. Um, you know, say, you, you know, you were at a, 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 a meeting and, you know, someone was talking about um, radiation damage to, to blood vessels. Uh, but again, you know, part of their job is, is to do planning, right? And so they map out where the tumor is, and then they try to figure out how are they going to direct the radiation to center on the tumor, but spare as much as possible any normal surrounding tissue. And so it depends which direction the beam is coming in. Um, you know, it, it depends on the strength of the beam. Sometimes they, they have techniques where they do a little bit from various directions and, you know, from the, uh, so they're able to get, get the whole tumor, but, you know, there may be particular orientations where, um, that kind of forms the, the bulk of the, the treatment. Certainly, you know, radiation has a lot of effects and systemic effects. We'll talk about, you know, fatigue later on, yeah. you know, you, you figure, well, why does radiation cause fatigue? I don't know why radiation causes fatigue, but it does. So this is a uh, Harvard medical school. So, you know, as, as mentioning how radiation can also damage the inner lining of the coronary arteries, and this injury can promote the development of coronary artery disease, irrespective of other risk factors. So irrespective, we always think about, you know, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, family history. That's, that's why you get coronary artery disease. Well, you could also get coronary artery disease if you don't have any of those, but you've gotten radiation that exposed your blood vessel. So radiation is a risk factor for coronary artery disease. So if you look at these two panels here on the um, C, this, these were people that already had coronary artery disease and they divided people into low heart exposure from radiation and high heart, heart exposure from radiation. And if you already had coronary artery disease, the extra radiation didn't seem to make all that much of an effect. Those two lines kind of crisscross over one another. There's not a whole lot of difference between the two. But if you look in panel B, those were people who did not have a pre-existing coronary artery disease. And although their overall risk is low, 
there is a bigger difference between those people that got low amounts of radiation exposure to the heart versus those that got larger amount. So in fact, the, the group that got the larger amount of radiation exposure to the heart, they had three times the risk than the people who had the lower amount of radiation. So that is kind of proof that the radiation itself is the risk factor. Okay. So that kind of unmasked when you looked at people who didn't have coronary artery disease. We're gonna shift gears a little bit, getting back to fatigue. Cancer survivors often suffer from chronic fatigue. In fact, fatigue is the most reported persistent um, effect of cancer therapy. More than nausea, we hear a lot about nausea, we hear a lot about pain, and those yeah, are, are frequently uh, present in people, but the number one complaint is fatigue. And a lot of patients, assume that, well, I just need to get through this therapy and then the fatigue will go away. Most of the time that's true, but in, in one third of patients, the fatigue persists even after you've completed uh, chemotherapy. And in some cases it lasts for years. And, and that's, that's a problem. It's a, it, you know, obviously it, it negatively impacts the quality of life. It could affect your ability to work and earn a living. Um, it could affect your ability to perform activities of daily living independently. And that could be particularly important for uh, older people uh, who already may be having difficulties uh, maintaining their independence. So how do we, how do we combat cancer-related fatigue? Well, in some cases, uh, participating in a yoga program uh, may lead to significant improvement. Uh, uh, in uh, reducing fatigue and increasing a sense of vigor. So in this study, it was a 12-week program. Uh, they had two equal groups of people, uh, cancer, cancer survivors. And uh, in one group, they participated in a 12-week program of yoga. And the other group just had education classes, you know, healthy living and lifestyle classes, that, that kind of stuff. And then at the end of 12 weeks, they gave them questionnaires. And they were particular particular questionnaires, they were kind of standardized questionnaires that uh, gauge fatigue and gauge a sense of vigor. And what they found was that the group that participated in the yoga had significantly uh, reduced their sense of fatigue over that 12-week period and increased their sense of vigor. So uh, just a simple thing of participating in a, a yoga program, you know, not, not highly stressed, uh, but um, it helps. You know, starting with yoga may also be a good way to kind of ease your way into an exercise program. You may be so fatigued that, you know, the thought of starting an exercise program may be just too much to start with. Well, starting with uh, some yoga classes may be a good kind of segue into starting uh, an exercise program. So clearly it's important to stay physically active, but physical activity is not necessarily the same as exercise. So I see a lot of patients and they tell me how busy they are, um, but they're not breaking a sweat doing anything that they're doing. Physical activity is, uh, or exercise is planned, structured, and repetitive physical activity. Cancer patients can quickly become very physically deconditioned. It doesn't uh, take a very long time to, to become physically deconditioned. And it's now becoming recognized that cancer patients need something akin to cardiac rehab. Call it what you want, cancer rehab. Um, at uh, Novant, they're trying to get together what's called cancer wellness um, unfortunately, although we have more and more data that suggests that um, uh, such programs uh, benefit patients, uh, getting them back to you know normal, uh, better quality of lifestyle, getting them back to work, um, that insurance unfortunately doesn't doesn't support that. Sometimes it's hard to get patients in cardiac rehab too, um, and so right now a lot of these programs depend upon uh, foundational support in order to uh, fund them. But that is something that you're gonna see more and more of um, down the road. Now, uh, the, the majority of exercise intervention research in cancer has involved breast cancer patients, and to a lesser extent, uh, patients who have undergone stem cell transplants for hematologic malignancies. But uh, this uh, study, they looked at 14 uh, randomized controlled studies involving more than 700 breast cancer patients. And uh, the study in that large group of patients demonstrated a moderate to large effect on reducing symptoms of fatigue with a regular exercise program. So in addition to reducing fatigue, some potential benefits of regular exercise include lessening of depression or anxiety, improving sleep, uh, sleep quality, strengthening the immune system, and who doesn't need that in this pandemic, right? Uh, helping to achieve and maintain a good body weight and overall improving one's quality of life. 
one exercise is not suitable for, for everybody and exercise must be individualized. And it depends upon uh, physical limitations imposed by cancer, uh, by cancer surgery, um, by age and other comorbidities like uh, uh, back problems or arthritis. Um, and, you know, this is where, you know, having a, a cancer rehab where you have uh, specialists, they can kind of guide people in overcoming some of those limitations and uh, getting the best, best exercise program uh, to benefit them. So cancer survivors suffer multiple injuries to the cardiovascular, pulmonary, and skeletal muscle systems. The normal function of all three in unison uh, is what we commonly call physical fitness. So you need all three. You need good cardiovascular system. You need good lungs, good pulmonary system, and you need strong muscles, and that produces physical fitness. Uh, however, the cumulative effects of various insults, um, what we call the multiple hit theory, uh, impact on our ability to remain physically fit after a cancer diagnosis. Um, there's the direct uh, adverse effects of cancer. There's the common risk factors that we talked about, you know, the obesity, uh, hypertension seems to be more prevalent in the cancer population. There's also indirect effects. We talked about physical deconditioning. We talked about poor nutritional status. Sometimes you lose weight, sometimes you gain weight. But as a consequence of these multiple hits, cancer survivors living at least five years beyond their initial diagnosis have about a one and a half to three and a half fold increased cardiovascular mortality risk. I'm going to give you positive news. I don't want to depress anybody here. I hope this is empowering because there are things, there are steps that you can do. So we need to have strategies that are directed to offset these effects of anti-cancer therapy. So cardiac reserve is a measure of fitness. Poor cardiac reserve is bad. We know that from a bunch of different populations, uh, not only cancer populations, even cardiovascular populations, lung populations, and so forth. Fortunately, there's a potential remedy, and that is aerobic exercise training. That's the most effective way to improve cardiac reserve. This is a study uh, of childhood Hodgkin lymphoma survivors. The risk of any major cardiovascular event was reduced by more than half when the study participants exercised for at least three days a week for at least 20 minutes each time. Now, there's something on that slide called MET. So what's a MET? The use of METs are metabolic equivalents, and I have some, some handouts here that you can take along with you. Uh, it allows us to quantify exercise intensity. Okay, one MET is the amount of energy and calories burned at rest uh, for each minute. Okay, so a, an ordinary man generally burns 70, 70 calories in, in one hour at rest. A woman burns about 60 calories at rest over an hour. So METs allow us to, to kind of assess activities for how quickly we will burn calories doing that particular activity. There's also a bunch of online cal calculators and we'll go to the next slide there. Uh, well, this just shows you that, that, that nine met hour per week figure, that's that 30 minutes a day, at least three days a week, or getting close to that 150 minute of exercise that the American Cancer Society and the American Heart Association recommend. The benefits do keep continue as you exercise more, but, the, benef the amount of additional benefit with additional exercise seems to plateau off. So that nine mets met hours per week seems to be the important uh, um, uh, cutoff point. So you want to try to at least get to that, that level. So I, uh, this is an online uh, calculator. It's free. You just go metcalculator.com on the internet. And you kind of scroll down these things. After work, I try to exercise on my home treadmill for about an hour if I can. And I, uh, I set it's walking, it's on a treadmill, it's 3.5 miles an hour at 9% grade. And so when I scroll down, I put that information in, uh, it shows that that activity is eight metabolic equivalents, eight METs, and tells, even tells you how many calories burned, a little over 600 calories. But brisk walking on level ground, that's, that's about three and a half METs. Of, of, uh, of intensity. So 150 minutes a week is about two and a half hours, three and a half times two and a half is almost nine nets. So that's where you get that 150 minutes a week that you, they should strive for. This is uh, a review of a hundred uh, studies. So they, they pulled up all bunch of studies from various databases and they reviewed them. They combined the data and they showed that patients who exercise follow, following their cancer diagnosis had fewer cancer-related adverse effects. So now we're not even talking about heart disease anymore. We're talking about cancer. 
So, so patients who exercise following their cancer diagnosis had fewer cancer-related adverse effects and a lower risk for both cancer recurrence of their primary and development of new primary in the future. So exercise is not only good for the heart and overall fitness, but it, it also prevents cancer. This is all types of cancer. So again, the American Cancer Society and the American Heart Association, they mm-hmm. recommend 150 minutes of moderate aerobic exercise per week. But what if you can't exercise that much? What if 150 minutes a week is too much? Okay. Well, uh, this 2011 study published in the Lancet demonstrates that less is okay too. Individuals who averaged only 15 minutes of moderate exercise most days had significant health benefits compared to individuals who were inactive. Okay, so getting up and doing a little is better than doing nothing. And so even if you look at this uh, graph here, if you look uh, uh, on the horizontal there between 10 and 20, so 15, 15 minutes and you go straight up and where that little triangle is, that shows that there is a 14% benefit if you exercise for 15 minutes a day compared to if you didn't. And that's all cause mortality, not only cancer mort- mortality, but everything. So if you want to reduce your uh, your mortality and extend your life, exercise seems to be the best thing that you can do for yourself. Physical activity is not necessarily exercise. And we're not we're not talking about any exercise, we're talking about moderate intensity exercise. So moderate intensity exercise means that you, you break out a little bit of perspiration. You know, I, I have a little dog, I have a little uh, miniature dachshund, so we walk her. But I wouldn't call that exercise because my dog, you know, takes two steps, stops and smells, takes two more steps, stops and smells. Now I might be out there a while and I might, you know, take a few, take a number of steps, but that's not really exercise. Exercise is, is more continuous where you're actually keeping your heart rate up a certain length of time and you begin to perspire a little bit. So you get a little, little dewy on the, on the forehead. What I want to show you on this slide is that, um, that this benefit, uh, even of low volume exercise, you know, just 15 minutes of, con- of continuous exercise uh, a day. It, it's, see, we, we got everything to the, the left that's benefit. So it doesn't matter if you're a man, you're a woman, doesn't matter if you're young or old, doesn't matter if you have hypertension, don't have hypertension, diabetes, no, hyper, no, no diabetes, uh, it doesn't matter. It benefits everybody. We'll just kind of go quickly uh, over this. This is, this is, there's a lot of data here, but again, specifically because we're, we're a lung cancer group here, I highlighted lung cancer. We, we were talking about for all cancer types, but even lung cancer types benefit there. So, so if you look across uh, for the inactive people, again, they get that hazard ratio score of one that's neutral. Anything less than one is beneficial on this table. And if you look across there, for medium high, very high levels of physical activity uh, among the lung cancer patients, all those HRs, those hazard ratios are all less than one. So benef- it benefits uh, lung cancer population. So now I'm not going to accuse anyone here of uh, being a smoker, but there are smokers who continue to smoke even after diagnosis of lung cancer, just like there are people who continue to smoke after they have a heart attack or after they have heart bypass surgery. It's a very hard habit to break. Nevertheless, smoking cessation after diagnosis of early stage lung cancer does improve survival because nowadays around 20% of lung cancer patients present early enough to be treated with curative intent and quitting does improve outcomes. So uh, based upon life table models, I kind of inserted that uh, on this slide here. Uh, Life table models are used by the insurance industry and the number of deaths prevented by smoking cessation is much greater than we would expect just by reducing uh, cardiovascular risk. So whereas smoking cessation in general population increased five-year survival by two percentage points, smoking cessation after a diagnosis of early stage lung cancer increased five-year survival by 35%. So really makes a big difference. Uh, this just shows pretty much the same information. And finally, I don't want to neglect mentioning the importance of managing hypertension, both in the general population and in patients with cancer. And as you can see by the downward slope of these lines representing mortality due to ischemic heart disease versus systolic blood pressure on the left side and stroke versus systolic blood pressure on the right side, the risk of heart disease and stroke diminishes in all age groups as blood pressure improves. You don't need large changes in blood pressure to produce beneficial effect. So a 10 millimeter uh, mercury reduction in systolic blood pressure reduces the risk of stroke death by 40%, reduces the risk of ischemic heart 
disease, heart attack death by 30%. And even just two millimeters reduces the stroke uh, death rate 10% and the uh, ischemic heart disease death rate 7%. So um, it, it's kind of like exercise, you know, even a, even a little improvement produces really big effects. So, so you know, you could say you get a lot of bang for the buck with doing those two things. So uh, hypertension is potentially one of the multiple hits that contributes to increased uh, cardiovascular mortality in cancer survivors. And when present, it actually has a huge effect. But the good news is that hypertension is also highly manageable. And these are four things that people can do to lower their blood pressure. If you're overweight, try to lose about 5% of your body weight. That's about 10 pounds for most people. Um, lower your daily sodium intake by 1,000 milligrams or to a total of less than 1,500 milligrams a day. You're going to have to read food package labels for sodium content. Avoid prepared foods. Try to cook from scratch and add less salt than what recipes may call for. Get 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week. Again, get a little, little perspiration on the brow doing, those, doing that exercise. And uh, reduce your alcohol consumption to not more than two drinks per day if you're a man and not more than one drink per day if you're a woman. And uh, doing all those things could potentially improve systolic blood pressure by 20 millimeters of mercury without additional medications. Uh, strive to maintain resting blood pressure generally under 130 over 80. So, so uh, if you don't have hypertension and you don't have heart failure, then you could use salt freely. On the other hand, if you have hypertension, then you do have to cut back on the salt. Clearly uh, for management of hypertension, if you have hypertension, cutting out the salt or reducing it is best. This is the end of my talk. Uh, we covered a lot of ground, looked at a lot of tables. I'm sure some of it was, you know, kind of made your head spin a little bit. I didn't mean to make anybody depressed. Uh, what I want you to do is to uh, take these, these four things uh, home with you. So make regular exercise part of your daily routine. That's going to help. Uh, redo your, review your chest CT scan and report for mention of coronary calcifications so that nothing is missed. And uh, if you're at risk, that risk is addressed. Don't smoke. And finally, manage your blood pressure. So uh, this is a quote, Francis Bacon. Uh, he said, knowledge is power. And, and it really is because you can take charge of things. You know, you do have some control. A lot of times you feel like you don't have control, but you do have some control. Mm -hmm.